we just want to welcome everyone to the Rogers Free Library, and now Adam Ray will speak to you. Oh, thank you. When there's cookies and water here, if anybody feels the need, please help us. Joni, this took half my speech. I'm going to be very brief because I'd rather hear the two of them talk than hear myself talk. Um, so anyway, just uh, just briefly, the, this event is a collaboration for the Roger Williams Library and the Rogers Free Library, um, really between two two endowments that we have, our Mary Teth White um, talking to the library um, endowment and the uh, Jane Bodell endowment that, that Rogers Free has. So twice a year we join forces and, uh, and put on a program here in town. Um, and uh, for the students in the room, uh, actually for anybody in the room, um, we do have one, one more talk this, this season um, at, at the library on campus next Thursday at 4.30 with Steve Allman. Oh, um, it's, um, the title of his talk is, going, is From Rage to the Page, um, and it's about um, how writers and artists can respond to the political and cultural environment that they find themselves um, in depending on whatever perspective they have. Although I think uh, those of us who know Steve can be pretty certain what perspective he has. <laughs> um, uh, but he's a very dynamic speaker. So that's at 4.30, yes, obviously. Well, everybody's welcome to, to come to that. Um, otherwise, I'm basically just going to hand this over to Susan Tayson, who um, uh, is a Rhode Island-based writer. Um, and she also teaches uh, writing courses here uh, at the library. Um, as well, and um, and Amy Wallen, who is a California-based writer, uh, who has written this memoir uh, about her time growing up around the world, um, um, that looks at issues of memory and family and place and so on, um, called "When We Were Ghouls." That's a careful. Well said. I'm going to let them instead of me explaining everything that you're about to hear, we'll just let them talk. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Andy. Oh, and there are books for sale here if anybody is interested. They are $17 with tax, and that's 20% discount from the, the, the regular price. Okay. Nice. That's as important as the food. <laughs> um, are we good with this, this thing here? Are we? Can you guys hear us? Can okay? you hear us? Yes. Oh, good. Okay, yes, uh, a quick plug. Steve Almond is um, irreverent and, and, and energetic and wonderful, well worth spending time listening to him um, speak. Okay. All right, we can be irreverent too. Yes, we can. We <laughs> might be. So, you, yes, we can be even more irreverent than Steve. Okay, um, I have a formal introduction that I'm going to read um, because we're very fortunate to have Amy Wallen here visiting from the West Coast. Amy is a writer, an editor, a teacher, and a baker. She's the author of the best-selling novel Moon Pies and Movie Stars, which writer Mary Gordon called a delightful and exhilarating journey, kind of like being on a tour bus guided by Eudora Welty on speed, <laughs> <laughs> which isn't that much of a stretch if you think about it. Um, the, the, the simile. Amy's essays have been published in the Gettysburg Review, The Normal School, Country Living, The Writer's Chronicle, and other national magazines. Amy is associate director at the fabulous New York State Summer Writers Institute. Familiarize yourself with this organization and the wonderful opportunities it offers for writers if you are not familiar with it. Um, Amy facilitates manuscript workshops in San Diego, which is a great place to do a manuscript <laughs> or anything. Um, she teaches novel writing at UC San Diego Extension. She founded Dime Stories, which is so cool. It's a podcast series. It's a great idea for, um, for authors to read original three-minute stories. And it could be fiction or nonfiction. Very, very cool. She hosts Savory Salons, which is her way, and I'm quoting Amy now, of bringing pies and writing together in small gatherings at her home for lively conversations about a writer's latest book. Writers have to eat, and if you have to eat and you get pie, that's even better. Um, I hear they're really 
good too. I think they're good. I, yes. I, buy them. I bake them for me, really. Yeah, that makes sense. That's why they're good. <laughs> um, Amy holds an MFA from Vermont College of Fine Arts, and she joins us today from the West Coast to talk about her latest book, The Memoir When We Were Ghouls, which is published by University of Nebraska Press for the American Lives series. Um, Tobias Wolf is the editor of that series. And officially, please welcome Amy Wallen to our <laughs> library. Thanks. Yeah, that was fun to do. Um, and to, to meet Amy tonight, we had a glass of wine. And I said, if Amy has wine, I'm going to have wine. And if Amy has more wine, then I'm going to have a little bit more wine. But we, <laughs> we only had one glass each, so we're. We should be okay. We should be okay. Yeah. If it gets embarrassing, we'll. We'll, we'll just have more, more wine. wine. Right, right, right. <laughs> we've, got, we've got this. Um, so I have questions, but maybe you want to read a little bit first from the book? Sure, or sure. I'll read something. Do you want to pick? Yeah, I have a little something I read sometimes that um, is short, but also because Adam mentioned the memory stuff, so it kind of gives a little entry, entree into, into the memory um, aspect of the book. But um, we, the the genesis of this book, if that's the way to think of it, I guess, is I couldn't really remember what the story was. So I was calling my home to my family. So that's part of the book, is actually trying to figure out what the story was. Um, and then I played a lot with memory based on that um, in the writing and then also just in the discovery of more of the story. Um, but. Also, then discovering more about my family as I'm having this kind of, so present day discovery as well as uh, the past. So, and one of the things my parents do when um, you had mentioned my if my parents were still alive, and so maybe this will help with that conversation too. Is my parents are still alive, and one of the things they still do is when I call home, they're in their late 80s, is they put me on speakerphone, and then they argue with one another. <laughs> so right. I just sit there and pretty much listen. But I might start with a, a question. Or, but, but at this point, um, when we were ghouls is the title, because I'm trying to remember a time when we were actually digging up a pre-Inca grave. And so I'm um, calling home to find out why we were there. Like, how did we end up at this place? How did we know about this? What was happening? What was going on? My mother denies we ever did it. And my father knows every possible detail you can imagine, like photographic memory-esque kind of uh, discussion. So they're arguing about whether or not it had happened. So this is my father. Mart, of course there was a body. My father argues with my mom while I'm on the phone. We didn't have any respect for the dead, she says, none. We were ghouls. She lets her own memory flip from one thought, one belief, one ideal to the next, whatever suits her, or does she? My own memory seemed to decide on their own when to show up, so maybe hers do too. I listen to her deny the pile of bones we unearthed, but I also fixate on the word ghouls. Something about me likes the idea of having a family made up of looters, grave robbers, and ghouls. The monsters incarnate. When I was young, I knew my mom was every bit as beautiful as Lily Munster, my dad as goofy as Herman. It's funny at first, and then maybe not so funny. I didn't know what we were doing, my mom repeats. I had no idea. Her denial is vexing. Denial, the finest form of forgetfulness. She will insist she had no part in it until we agree with her. It's what she does. She wants it to go away. I would normally give in to her, want her to see how loyal I am. But this story I cannot give away, especially now that these memories are coming back to me like white horses pushing me under. I need to know all the facts. I need to start at the beginning, know how we got here, how we got there. I ask how they knew, where to go, and my mother replies, someone told us about it at the dinner party the night before. And my dad says, and they had said it was a burial site, so what did you think we were doing, my father queries her. Um, I'll just read a little more to get to the memory that didn't happen. <laughs> um, when we first arrived, this is my father again, we had to drive over the two split logs. Remember that? My father tromps down Cemetery Lane. I don't remember that detail at all. It sounds scary, I say. No, no, they had a sense of humor, he said. The Riley's car wouldn't go over the logs, but ours would. So we all piled in our car and drove over. And then we came around a corner and had to stop because there was a big mound of dirt. 
On top of the mound was a mummified skeleton propped up announcing the entrance to the cemetery. He laughs. He likes this part. We both do. Our dark senses of humor are complimentary. I should be writing this down, I think, but I don't, not yet, because I want to just listen and ask questions, to sift through the silt of memory and find mine, and see what matches, what doesn't, what might fit together, like a skeleton. There wasn't, an, a, there wasn't a body in the grave, my mom says again. We never found a body, I would remember. I have the vision of her yelling at the diggers to retrieve the skull that they had flung out at the grave. Sure we did, my father says. Remember, I kept the skull for years. A prince, he had that silver band around his forehead. I hadn't remembered the silver band until he mentions it on the phone call. But now I recall how that was the determining factor that the body we had unearthed was valuable, was a person worthy of respect, or I guess respect during his lifetime. A crown, silver, or maybe it was tin, meant royalty to us. Oh, God, that's right, my mom says. We kept that skull in the pantry where else do you keep a skull um, her memories come in lightning bolts like mine no that was marty's skull i say that's my brother he found it and kept it to make a lamp remember it sat in our pantry until it didn't marty wasn't there my dad says and my mind comes to a jolting halt as though while shoveling sand i've hit titanium and the blow jars me marty is the beginning of my tale he was always the part i knew was true why is my brother in my memory so clearly? I know I heard his voice over the sand dune. Why can I still see how he held up that skull and showed me the jawbone? Why do I remember him if he wasn't there? And then we go on from there to discover. We're tromping down Cemetery Lane <laughs> with Amy, and it's, it's a great ride. Um, I think that uh, to, to start with, well, I'll, I'll um, pick up a, 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 off what you've just read by telling you that I wanted to know if your parents are still alive because when I teach memoir, every time at some point, usually early on, someone or everyone says, I can't write this till everybody I know is dead. And they're insistent on it. And I don't know if it's avoidance behavior or fear or some combination. So you not only write this story, but you call your parents and you email your parents and you visit your parents and you ask them questions. And then you listen sometimes and sometimes you take notes and then you include the conversations and some of the information and some of your thoughts about those conversations and it, whether they're written or oral. Um, in the, the book itself. So it's sort of, it's one thread that appears and then disappears and appears and disappears from the now in the memoir. And it's very process oriented. It's very revelatory of, of, of memoir writing process. So it's, it's kind of you're laying bare the procedure by which you get some of this information or don't get some of this mm -hmm. information. And I was just, um, um, wondering if you could talk about the bravery um, of what that's like to A, ask them those questions, B, then write about them, and C, include the questions in there. And I, I was going to actually um, read with this question one of the examples because it's just too fun not to read. Um, so you get, a, from this little excerpt that I picked, you get a great sense of Amy's sense of humor in the book, um, her parents' sense of humor, <laughs> and the, the tenor of what these interactions were like um, in, in trying to get this information. So I call home again. I share my new information with my mother first. There is a curse on those who messed with those graves <laughs> like we did. That's why I have all these allergies, she replies matter-of-factly. She is allergic to everything from paper to pickles. She is not allergic to potatoes. Fortunately, vodka is made from potatoes, and my mother believes in curses. A lot of information in there, and you get a sense of character as well. I hear a mumbling in the background. It's Amy, she says. Then to me, your dad's home. I'll let him talk to you. Thanks, I say, appreciative of the approval. There is a curse, I tell my father, first thing through the phone. Digging up the grave means your life is cursed. 
My life cursed? He sounds surprised. You mean instead of just one Cadillac, it could have had two? <laughs> that would be my parents. <laughs> that would be Amy's parents. Um, yeah. Those conversations probably fa sound familiar to anybody who has a parent. Um, <laughs> but this is, this is different because this is um, going into the book. It's right. in the book. So can you talk about that oh, process? That? And well, I think the, f the four part comes from being in the publishing world and and knowing how hard it is to get published, I just sort of assumed it, it would never make it to the real world because oh, yeah, I have okay. sort of a pessimistic view, I think. Um, and then it did, and then I did go through the combination of, I mean, you could probably tell a little bit, my mom's a little bit narcissistic, and um, and so I thought, okay, my mother's either going to love it because a lot of it is about her or she's going to hate it. Um, and then I thought, this is why people say I'm not publishing it until they're dead, <laughs> is that process between when I got the publishing deal and when it came out. And I did have a little, um, I mean, I want to congratulate my parents for actually dealing with it. And I can tell you some interesting and funny and stories. But one was my mother read it, did, and she did think she was basically going to be the star of it. And she read it, and she was very excited, and she was all gung-ho, and then she read it, and she's kind of the antagonist in the book. <laughs> and uh, she calls me up, and she says, you make me look like a daiquiri, swilling, negligent mother um, who lived in Nigeria. And I said, well, actually, Mom, they weren't daiquiris. They were salty dogs. And she goes, oh, I, I did love those salty dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so it just kind of worked out. Like if you could just bring it back around to her, it worked out okay. And then, and then she calls my brother, and so this is my brother telling me about the phone conversation he had with her about it because she called him up. She goes, "Well, Amy's Amy's memory is just really wrong." Well, the whole book is about how my memory is wrong, but she's like, "Her memory is really wrong." He, she just got everything wrong in that book. That was not the way it happened. And my brother, because there's one part in the book where my parents go into a pub in London and they leave me in the vestibule. And so I'm seven years old and I'm sitting on this vestibule with people coming and going. They say, well, they're in the pub drinking with their friends and I'm not allowed in. And so um, my brother says, yeah, her memory is wrong because I was actually with you guys in the pub and I remember and we left her there for three hours. So, you know, so it's like this, like, I didn't remember that it was, and when he told me that, I was like, wow, really for three hours? And he's like, yeah. So there's, I play with the whole idea of n none of us really remember I exactly and we don't really know what that exact, you know, what did actually happen in the past. And I don't believe anybody's memory is exact. What I was interested in, in all of these, was what is the truth in between them? Because I felt like the cracks in between all of those is, are really, what maybe not what happened, but who this family was. Because I was trying to figure out, the, the question I have throughout the whole book is, are we hideous people? Are we ghouls? Are we, are we, do we, are we you know, awful people? And yet, we're a family and fairly cohesive, so. Yeah, that's a great a great anecdote for for your mom. It's almost My like the book needs an anecdote. afterword. Yeah, <laughs> this, the, this little like what was it like? Because because that is a question for memoir writers. It it feels um, forbidden. You know that mm -hmm. voice in your head is specific for memoir. I think in a way that it isn't for fiction because you can always say I made it up. Um, that's a, a great way to get at this question of. Um, one way to read When We Were Ghouls, I think, is as a coming-of-age story. Mm -hmm. And the book focuses on Amy, young Amy, I'm going to call you, um, from ages 7 to around 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, one description is, with my short and pudgy eight-year-old legs, I trudged back over to the far side of the deep sand dunes to hide. Hiding was what I did. Hiding was a place I could be myself, where I chose to be alone. I also hid, hoping my mom would come looking for me. She never did, but I still tried. Um, 
we read this book and we fall in love with young Amy oh. and we want to protect her and we want to be befriend her and I can't believe it was three hours that was it's a very <laughs> harrowing scene the doors are opening and closing people are going in and they're coming out drunk and and she's sitting there waiting apparently three hours you didn't know how long it was I so. didn't at the and at one point you hid and then they said well you're fine and it wasn't it's it's a harrowing scene but it's told through the voice of young Amy, so you're just sort of there with her, and you know she survived to write the memoir, so you know they didn't. She's not still in that vestibule. Um, so we do. We fall in love with you, and you're also quite independent and able to ask for what you need, even when you don't get it. So I was wondering, from from a writing standpoint, what it's like to go back and find seven, eight, nine-year-old Amy. And, and what was that experience like? Because you spent a lot of time with her, right? Right, yeah. Well, it was interesting because it, it did keep coming up without, when the book came, I was only gonna write an essay and I was gonna tell the story about the digging up the grave. I had no intention of, I fought to writing a memoir. Um, but, um, but I did keep coming up with this, what kept coming up was the abandonment and how they were so easily, able to leave a small child in different places. And I think the one for me is there's the when I'm seven and they leave me in Nigeria um, alone. So that was where I was like, okay, there's something, there's a theme here with my family. <laughs> um, and so, um, so there was this like, it was also that discovery of like, I do like being alone, like as an adult, I like being alone a lot. So there was also that like, oh, that's why I'm okay with being alone. And like, I have friends who are constantly like, you know, oh, my husband's going out of town. Can you come hang out with me? So I don't like being alone. And I'm always like, oh my God, I love it when my husband goes out of town. <laughs> okay. um, so it's, it's, you know, it was sort of like an interesting discovery of going back and hanging out with, with little Amy and then also hanging out with who my parents were like. I also gained a lot of compassion for my mom because she was basically a single mom in a lot of ways because my father's job took him into like the Niger Delta and also into the jungles, et cetera. So he wasn't home a lot. And so it was one of the things I realized like when I was little, I didn't realize what she was going through. As an adult looking back and her having to take care of little Amy, it was, Oh wow! I can't imagine being, you know, at, at the time she was around forty-two years old, looking back and thinking, I can't imagine being forty-two years old in Nigeria with a seven-year-old, not really knowing anyone, and having to get around. And I came from a tiny town in Texas, and having to, you know, get. So I, I gained a lot of compassion for my mother and what mm -hmm. she had to go through, and my father and my siblings. Um, and so it was the whole process was. Uh, you know, like a mirror, but then also seeing the other. I mean, when you're seven, you are in your own little world, your own little narcissism, and then looking back and sort of re going inside that again is sort of interesting. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I will say my mom, like, one of the things, like, she did, like, also in that memory, like, when she read the book, she said, Okay, I just want you to know, I'm reading the book, and I know you felt really bad, and you felt like we didn't love you, and we left you. I just want you to know, I really do love you and that I will never leave you. In fact, I'm going to haunt you for the rest of your life. <laughs> so. so your mom titled the book then. The, right, she did, <laughs> she, I should tell her that. Title, so yeah, yeah. I should tell her she would love to have credit for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, don't give it to her. Yeah. Um, no, that, that's interesting. Uh, so this abandon, the, the, it feels like there's abandonment, but there's resiliency, And but you're seven. Um, so, so, when We Were Ghouls is a coming of age story, I think, and, and it sounds like writing the book was also sort of a, a mm -hmm. coming of age in a way, as, as a book process should be. Mm -hmm. I mean, otherwise you could do something else, right? right. Bake a pie. Right. Um, and it also takes us on a journey. A, a, first of all, a literal journey. Your dad gets a job with an oil company, and we go from with you from blue collar Eli, Nevada, to Lagos, Nigeria, with eight million people or something, then to Lima, Peru, then to Bolivia, and then we return to the States. And this is in four years or so. About five or six four, years, yeah. Five or six, in the book it felt, yeah, about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, seven to 12, mm -hmm. so. You were there, so yeah. Right, yeah. I, I, got, I trust your, your memory on <laughs> okay. this one. Um, and you describe, the, the book describes, um, takes us through the cultural changes that you experience, and, and I should say because 
some of you probably haven't read the book yet because you haven't bought it yet. Um, Amy's brother and sister are in 11th and 12th grade, and the American school in Nigeria only goes up to 8th, so they get shipped off to Switzerland. And so it reads like Amy's an only child, but there are these mm -hmm. occasional appearances of the siblings, and they come and then they leave, and they manage to reveal the fact that there is no Santa, which is another sense of abandonment because, you know, like she's in Nigeria with her Barbie dolls. The least they could leave you is Santa, and, you know, that goes out the window, too. It's really, you just really want to hug young Amy. Um, so there's these cultural changes that you experience, and there's also, what was interesting to me was there's a shift in apparent social status. Mm -hmm. Because um, I was, and so my question is, what is it like to write about that shift? You're going from, and I'm quoting you, a dumpy blue-collar blue house eating beans and cornbread to servants and swimming pools and fancy parties. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, in addition to, you know, not speaking the language and your siblings are gone and your dad's out somewhere doing something and mom gets malaria because, yeah. you know. Well, and I think does. that's the, um, the part I was also trying to examine in that question of are we hideous people? Because we went from mm -hmm. being blue collar to suddenly being white collar, but you know, like that first scene is we're exploiting, you know, the family. I mean, I'm an eight year old, so I'm complicit only in the fact that, well, I'm making these huge like, but I'm eight years old, so I'm drug along on the trip. But who are these people that are exploiting the land and the people? And, you know, the oil company is, um, you know, raping and pillaging the land as well. But um, we're, so who are we as people? We're, you know, ugly Americans, basically. Um, and, at the same time, one of the also really great things about my, about my mom was she was really involved. Like she usually didn't like hanging out with the American women. She did like uh, finding the local women and getting to more involved in what they were doing. Like she wanted to learn the language really badly. She wanted to be part of that group of women. Um, and and I, mean, I think in some ways also again sort of looking back, I think she felt ostracized because she wasn't. You know, she hadn't gone to college like most of those women had, and mm -hmm. so. But then she could be with the like the Bolivian women, who were the upper class Bolivian women. We weren't, um, you know, with the street. I was actually. I played with the kids on the street, but it was, it was culturally. She liked getting involved in that world, and um, so I think that was one of the benefits to it. But I think a lot of that again comes from. We didn't know our place because we weren't. It was a new. We were. It was an odd situation you know we weren't um, my dad's job wasn't it gave him a lot of benefits but he wasn't like a high-level executive it was just enough that we got really nice things when you go overseas with an oil company they you know put you up really well you come back to the States you're right back where you started from just interesting so too. yeah so coming back we were back in the dumpy little house and you know it was a better situation than it had been before we left but yeah yeah. And you knew you were sort of there's home no servants, again, there's no yeah, right, right, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's um, interesting because the bracketing of the, the the parameters of the memoir, the material you chose, mm -hmm. makes sense because of that. Because mm -hmm. it is almost like you were taken out of this situation and then put back, and that that taking out and what in, ensued from that is is the story mm -hmm. is where the story gets because it so challenges on so many levels. Exactly. Um, like, who are we because of that time? Yeah. And, and it makes um, an interesting, I think, um, commentary on just sort of a sociological level, what happens to identity when it gets plucked out of the familiar mm -hmm. by whatever, your dad's job, um, a death in the family, uh, you know, a, a, the, a, a hurricane, mm -hmm. um, you know, a political change in your neighborhood, something like that. What, you know, where does identity go? And that's one of the great things about the read is that we watch this child in real time. This is a, a great accomplishment in the writing um, for the reader to have um, that, that experience. It's so, it feels so real. It feels so, and again, I said she's, she feels abandoned, but she also feels resilient somehow and very observant. Mm -hmm. And um, it's wonderful to, to be there, but not like fall in the sewer and have to be washed with Fizohex, which I had, I had, you know, it, it triggers memories too, mm -hmm. the book, so 
your own ghouls. And right. um, so it's, it's some crazy stuff going on there that's told in a very straightforward manner. Oh, thanks. Um, but kind of creepy. So the, the memoir also takes on the personal and shows where it gets political. Mm. Mm -hmm. So we have the Biafran War. And you write, it was started by my people, the countries with red, white, and blue flags, American culture class, my motherland, my family, entitlement. Is it part of our culture? What culture do I belong to? You write about everyone being asked to leave Bolivia, I think it was, except for Sears, mm -hmm. which is ironic, mm -hmm. um, and RC Cola. Mm -hmm. like they can stay, mm -hmm. the big corporations can stay, but everybody else has to get out. Mm -hmm. You describe your quest for what lies between innocence and guilt, which is, a very intense question that you, we could ask ourselves daily still, um, no matter where we are. Um, but you were a, a child in these travels. You had nannies, you had adults cooking you meals and sending you to bed. You went to school in countries whose languages you didn't speak, um, whose customs were utterly unfamiliar. You saw more dead bodies in various states of decomposition than anyone should see, and especially a child, um, most of us will not ever see as many dead, but look how calm she looks. It's like, <laughs> it's like I, when I was going to meet you, I was going to think, I was thinking, oh, am I going to be able to tell that you've seen all these dead bodies? Like, <laughs> waiting for, watching, you know, with friends, watching, when's it going to pop? What was it, is that the verb? You, when we were like, seven, yeah, we were like seven. It's getting our school bigger bus and bigger, and now it's going to go. And yeah, just, our school bus kept driving by this one body on the side, and I Nigeria it was the, the poverty was ex extreme the extremest of extremes and um, there was a body on the side of the road for several days so uh, my friend and I we were like taking bets on when the body was gonna pop that's resilience so, right? yeah. and that's um, a awful. child's view you know that's right. um, and and so can you talk about what execution days were I just thought oh, maybe sure. you should say that well, because, because you guys have snow days right <laughs> Well, we moved from Ni from Ely, Nevada to Lagos, Nigeria. So one's on the equator and one's in the mountains and the Sierra is at 8,000 feet. And um, you can guess which one. Um, and so in Ely, we had snow days because, you know, when it snows and there's too much on the ground, that, you know, we can't get to the school, we had snow days and you know, usually made up for them at the end of the school year. Well, in Nigeria, the... Um, the public execution theater was next door where the army barracks were, next door to our school, and all that separated us was a chain link fence uh, between us and the public, and the public execution arena was basically um, three oil barrels, and they used, they just uh, used the army guys with their machine, or machine guns, or their rifles, or whatever, to shoot the, so we got execution days off, because they didn't want the kids to be at school for the, and I thought it was because they didn't want us to be there for the executions, but I learned later is because the traffic in Victoria, on Vic, our schools on Victoria Island, was so bad because everybody wanted to go to the executions that they let us out of school. So because the bus, school bus, it was too much for the traffic to get to school. So I would get execution days off. So when I was a kid, you know how snow days make you so happy? Mm -hmm. The execution days were pretty cool because we got out of school. <laughs> But you didn't think like that, that we did. But you but did, it was a day off. I, yeah, mean, it was I got to hang out with my mom that day. So right, yeah, yeah so, so it was all good. Um, very different, very different experience in the book. So um, think about that next time you get a snow day. <laughs> or, don't, or you don't get a snow day, you right. complain about yeah, it. Right. You can <laughs> you have, have execution to, days. Yeah, when the, the, we shouldn't even. Mm -mm. Not in this day and age, we shouldn't think we like shouldn't that. Think it that. could happen. We didn't, you didn't hear that here. Right. Um, not a good idea. Um, so, okay, so you fold into the memoir fun cultural references that provide flavor as well as context. Some are heavy, like Richard Nixon resigning mm -hmm. and the Manson murders. Mm -hmm. There was a two-part special. Her mom let her watch the first part and then decided she couldn't watch the second part, which really doesn't seem fair at all. Well, interesting that the first part was the goriest part. Yeah, yeah. It's the second part was just the trials. Apparently, yeah, she yeah, dismissed it. it yeah. <laughs> but other references are lighter, like comparing your parents to Herman and Lily Munster, mm -hmm. and a teacher who looks like Samantha Stevens from Bewitched, um, but that teacher's nothing like the, oh. the real Samantha. Um, so much of the delight in reading the book comes from young Amy's observations and the voice you give her to describe her experiences. And here's a, a quote. I am a petunia in an onion patch, my mother once told me. She, the petunia, her family, the onion patch. 
It was becoming clear to me that I couldn't be like her. I wasn't even sure what a petunia was. I truncated it a little bit because it's got piccolo stuff in it too. But um, And so, you know, you talked about in the book the snubs from other kids, the fears, the excitement of seeing your siblings once in a while. Um, so there's humor and a kind of good naturedness. Like even now you're talking about it and you're mm -hmm. feeling, talking about your mom and feeling clearer about how you feel about her and getting more perspective on her. Um, so I was wondering if you were conscious of giving Amy this tone, did you try in different voices before you kind of struck the gold of what you did strike here? Oh, sure. You know, it was interesting in the process. Again, like I said, I resisted writing memoir, but then um, I think there was there was one draft where it, it got really ghoulish, I guess. You know, it got a little too serious for me. Even I would read, like, I'd read the draft, and I was just like, oh, God, who, why? And I went, my family is very funny. Everybody has its a sort of, you know, I mean, put your own analysis on that, and it's probably true. Um, uh, we're very sarcastic and very, you know, um, ghoulish. We have a dark sense of humor. And um, I think... I realized that wasn't there. You know, that's a really that's a part of my family that I really like. Like that's the part that makes it fun hanging out with my family. And I had to go back in and really weave that in and look for that and think about when that would have come up because um you know, my mom my mom can be funny and she can look at herself and see, you know, she's not as as narcissistic as I might make her out to sound on the first go round, um, she still won't really talk to me about the book. But um, and then when I was just home, actually about a month ago with my brother, we were sitting at the dinner table, and come to find out during the Biafran War, we had to be ready to leave. They said my brother was talking about a boat that he used to uh, go out on with a friend of his when he would come to visit from boarding school. And my dad said, well, you know why that boat was in the harbor? Because it was one of the other oil company's boats. And he goes, oh, yeah, it's because we had to be able to evacuate within 12 hours at all times. And I said, I had, like, I had no idea. And I said, we had to be ready to evacuate? I said, so when I was left there, when I was seven by myself, if we had to evacuate, what would have happened to me? And my brother was like, oh, you would have been raised by Alice. And, you know, it became this, like, joke. And my mom just got, like, real quiet, like, didn't say anything. But it became, like, a joke. But I'm also thinking in the back of my head, I'm thinking, what if we had to evacuate? And I was, like, would I, one, would I be alive? Two, would I be, you know, living with my nanny Alice and her family? <laughs> Which probably would have been kind of cool. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so there's things that are still discovery and still, but I felt like each draft, I felt like I got closer to what I felt my family was really like, which is dark and funny and, um, and we do have these conversations. I mean, this is what we do. We have these conversations. We're still having them. I know it's not a, I mean, that's why the conversations are in there because that's what we do, so. And it works to, 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 um highlight process too mm -hmm. which is wonderful for the reader just to send, and for the writer to think about how you present material like this and what's the best um, expression you can give it you know how you can how you can make that sing that way and I'm glad you didn't have to evacuate <laughs> Me too. I'm already worried about young Amy <laughs> and I know she's okay so um, so so, but you did, it's interesting that you had to kind of go dark, dark mm -hmm. in the writing first. Like, let me strip all that humor out and then kind of bring it back because it's, it felt wrong to you, but mm -hmm. you had to kind of pull it all in one direction, which again speaks to process and how. I think the level of forgiveness, like I also reached a place of forgiveness, mm -hmm. uh, and that word sometimes gets thrown around too much, but I think for me there was this part of like, like I said, I got, I, I realized, wow, my mom was there also alone as a single mom, I mean, things like that, that brought me to a different place that I'm like, okay, I actually need to tell this story without being angry, mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is, is good to remember if you are writing a memoir and you're afraid that all those people who are still alive are gonna read it, it works out. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's okay, right. mom forgives, has a drink. Right, good. she just has another she drink. She has around. another drink, which is good. Um, so, are we, so, so we, I have two more questions, but we can open it up, I don't wanna, do we have questions that we want to ask? Anybody you can or? ask me anything. <coughs> sure. How did the rest of your family, your father and your siblings, mm -hmm. um, think about the book? How did they accept what you wrote? 
Um, they actually were pretty, they did pretty well too. My sister, who I have sort of an on again, off again a little, we're sisters. <laughs> um, so yeah. so um, I was worried about her. She's not in it as much because it was, she actually wasn't really around much. Uh, she went away to boarding school and then she'd come home once in a while. Um, and, um, but she said she got it, read it right away and um, said that I got all the abandonments. She, she had those same kinds of experiences, you know. Um, and I wasn't sure how she would take it. She was mm -hmm. one I was, I even sent the book to her specifically and said, hey, I want you to have this so you feel like, you know, so you, I mean, in my mind I'm thinking so you feel like you got it, but I was like, I want you to be one of the first ones to have it. Um, my brother is kind of the hero in the book, so I even at one point when he was reading and I said, I bet it's a little weird to read a book about your, like you're in it, like you're the, you know, the protagonist in the story or you're the, one of the main characters. And he said, he said, no, he said, but I actually like, he said, I like uh, the guy in the story that better than the guy I live with every day. So, so that was something. Um, but he is kind of, he is my hero, uh, you know, so I think obviously that was my own um, bias as well. Um, and then my dad, which is actually an interesting part of sort of that post-publication stuff too, is my father, since the book was published, or since I got the book deal, um, it was before it was published, was diagnosed with dementia. And he has, it's interesting because there's actually a part of the book where um, there's this part where I, I feel I'm, I, I, I am wondering if he's part of the DEA because of the places where we're living. And I'm trying to get that information from him and he won't give me the information. He won't tell me. And his friend, but it's really, I mean, I know certain friends of his were. And so I'm trying to get the information from him. And then as I'm calling home and asking these questions, he's like, telling me some of the stories he had told that were, you know, suspiciously DIA or CIA connection stuff, and they get more and more elaborate. And so I tell those stories, and here I share those stories of him giving me more information, and I'm thinking, because it's about me, <laughs> that he's about to tell me, like he's revealing more to me, like he's, I'm special, and he's gonna tell me more. Um, he's gonna give me the secrets. And then we find out he has dementia, and one of the things I learned in the process when we were going through this uh, part with him was this dementia, like we're starting to see it more. Um, I, I, I find out and I read more about it, and basically the kind he has is, is his memories, his long-term memories actually get more detailed mm -hmm. instead of being more, so when he's telling me a story, he does tell me more detail. But they're interesting details like this is aside from the CIA part, but I, one of the things I had asked him out after the book uh, came was, uh, um, um, "Tell me about your first day of work." And it used to be, that, and my dad's very like he like looks like, or at least it looked like John Wayne. He's Mr. Macho and a Texan, and um, it used to be this real machismo story. So then he tells me this story this time, where it's all about it's like got all the same elements of the same story about the first day. And he's there with all these guys, and they're going out onto the drilling sites. And but then he just keeps adding in this one element about how all the other guys had metal lunch pails, and he had a paper sack, and how embarrassing that was. And for a whole week, he had to go to work with just a paper sack for his lunch, and he, all the other guys had these metal lunch boxes, and how humiliated. And it was just like my dad kind of has always walked around with all this shame, and it was kind of like the shame was sort of oozing out of him now. So because I play with memory in this, I found the dementia thing like afterward became again more of like, wow, this book is even like now I even have more thoughts about memory than I did before. Um, and then my mom's reactions were basically what I told you. And she basically when I bring up, I like I'm going to the East Coast for my book. And she's like, uh huh. So. <laughs> She does redeem herself, though, in Peru, I think, with patent leather shoes, um, how she just... Oh, how she made me wear patent leather shoes instead of, yeah. Instead of the... The leather. Shoes, um, the communist shoes. And how, right, and it just... That, that particular scene just blew my mind because it was a government thing, and she hadn't done it right, and she just owned right up to it and took you right to... The place where you could get the appropriate shoes. Right. Though the patent leather sounded beautiful. Um, they were good looking so shoes. Yeah. I just had to say. Like such good looking shoes. And um, so and, and so after I read that I said to myself, Yes, she is a good mom. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Yeah, yeah, no, and she was. I mean, and she was fun to be with. So, yeah, yeah. But just for the rest of you know, too, in, in um, Peru, I'm sorry, we had to wear a school uniform. The government required it. So every school had the exact same uniform across the entire country so that we all looked equal. Um, and I showed up. My mom, we were supposed to wear black shoes, black leather shoes. My mother bought me patent leather shoes. I got sent to the office my first day of school in Peru because I was wearing patent leather shoes because the government would not allow it. And my mother... Was, she got called to pick me up, and she was not happy about having to, yeah. It's like, seriously, you're making, you're gonna make me, you called me in here for this? So, yeah. Dress code. Right. Yeah. There, there are a lot of wonderful details <laughs> like that. Um, there's a line, who needs parents when you have inoculations? <laughs> um, and, and, and lots of interesting observations about memory, and it is, it does seem, it's poignant that your dad is coming down with dementia and, and you know, the details are coming out and there are poignant details too about the paper sack for the um, lunch and, um, and there's a, a, a wonderful line that I'll, I'll um, read. My family was always doing that, telling me it couldn't have happened that way. Um, and yet that, that's in the book and mm -hmm. you wrote the book. And it's a wonderful book, as you can tell. Um, and it has everything from dead bodies to patent leather shoes to uh, drinking moms and uh, interesting siblings and breaks the myth of Santa once and for all. And um, what next? Do you know what's next for you? Um, yeah, uh, well, maybe not. I don't know. I, I, that was a, not a straight answer at all there. But um, <laughs> it, was just, it was an out of the book. Uh, yeah, I, I avoided that one. I, yeah, but that's a good. That's a good one, unless we have more questions here. But that's a good closing question. Of what? What is next? Yeah. yeah. Um, a couple of different things. One, I'm taking notes on my father and his dementia because, again, there's a lot of humor and sadness in that as well, um, and getting to know him through that process. Um, it's hard, obviously, for him, and he's a, he's still at that stage where he's aware. He has it, but doesn't want to admit he has it, and um, and then just the transitions of that whole um, part of our lives, and uh, he has a lot of stories. So like the fear of losing those stories. So I'm taking notes on that. I think I still. I mean, because he's going through, I think it might be too close for another memoir. Again, I never tried. I never intended to be a memoirist. Mm -hmm. I have another couple of fiction things I'm working on. One is a novel I've been working on for many years about a. I actually worked in El Salvador for a while with a maternal and child health um, nonprofit, and um, I have a story about a guy who, when I worked down there, he was, um, it was right after their war, and um, a combination of things was, you know, like in their desk drawers there would be a grenade, uh, which, you know, I was always like, well, <laughs> um, and then also, um, one particular family that I usually stayed with when I would go down there, um, they had wanted to immigrate, immigrate and the husband was a, a doctor. And he had always said, to, the wife wanted to immigrate to the U.S. because it was so dangerous in El Salvador. Like, we would go to buy bread and it was, you know, barred windows. And this is the nice part of town. And we had to hand everything through little windows. And, um, and so I just, I, the, the novel is, what if they had, the, so the f husband said, we can't immigrate because I'd have to be a gardener. I don't want, I want, I'm a doctor in San Salvador and I have a career. If I went to the States, I'd have to be a gardener. And so I imagine him, because also everybody was getting brutally murdered. So what would have happened had his family, um, something had happened to his family and he had immigrated, what would he, what would his life be like? Um, so it takes place in Burbank. Um, <laughs> at an old folks home kind of thing and um and he's the gardener um but he's also a doctor so he's with these older people which is sort of ironic because now i'm also with the other so i'm obviously dealing with a lot of old people in my stories and then i have a uh, another book that i'm working on a collaboration with a friend of mine and it's how to write a novel in 20 pies <laughs> and he's an illustrator that sounds good and it's an <laughs> irreverent uh book on a little bit of the process I went through to get my novel, my first novel published. And um, so everything from sitting down, writing the book all the way through, getting a book deal and celebrating that. And it's, um, it's 
got some advice, but we do, he's an illustrator, so he works for an advertising agent, does really irreverent um, illustrations. It's kind of like an Annie Lamont, uh, bird by bird, with a little bit of Nora Ephron. <laughs> and, um, and basically, pa, you mentioned the pie baker thing. How I got through writing my first novel was by baking pies. So when I would get stuck, or like, I don't know how to get through this obstacle, or I had to mull things over, or I just need to see something creative be finished because this is taking me so long, I would bake a pie. So it's about getting through the first novel with pie. So, but also how to do it with pie. That sounds good. So, yeah. And um, another book that it's just kind of playing around. So, so. That sounds great. It's interesting that the, the novel in progress is um, you're getting to move people from one country to, to another, another country, just like you were moved. And, but now you get to play with them, sort of like you played with your Barbies and the Miss Polly doll and all those wonderful. Right. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't really thought about that way, but it is sort of like taking that, like moving from one culture to the other. Yeah. Yeah, journeys. And the different, di demo also the reversal of the demographics. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and, and that's what? helpful. I can go no home and work on that yeah. now. I think that's probably worth a pie, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. <laughs> well, I think we should um, thank Amy and we should do book signing, unless there are questions, recipes. There are some recipes on the website, on Amy's website, for pies. Yeah, right. <laughs> or how to write a novel. How to write a novel. Yes, wonderful interviews and stuff. Well, thank you to Susan. That was fabulous. It was fun. Great questions. It was fun. Great, great book. It was ghoulish. Thank you. It's yeah. perfect. Perfect for October. So some, some book signing.